Hello. All right, I'm Robert, and I'm a real recovering alcoholic. Hey, Robert. Hey, Robert. All right, welcome to the Atlanta Step Up Society Big Book Studies of Alcoholics Anonymous. What I'm going to do this week, this is week two, I'm going to do a quick review, and then we're going to go right into the uh, book study again. All right. Uh, but there's one thing I want to, first let's open with a moment of si uh, serenity prayer, I'm sorry. Serenity prayer. God, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You know, I was thinking, um, a while people have brought it to my attention that uh, we probably want to have more of an open book study instead of a closed one. The difference is if you have an open book study, and anybody can come at any time. Um, me, myself, personally, I like to have closed book studies. But what we could do, I'll keep it open, and let's say maybe till we get past Bill's story. Anybody, you know, we get 20 or 30 people up to that point because it will grow fast. These book studies grow at a rapid pace. When I get to a certain point in the book study, I'm going to have to close it. Simple what I mean by closing, it'll just be the people who committed up to that point. You don't want to be in the fourth step and people come in here and asking you what is the disease concept. You know what I mean? I don't want to be going back and forth like an accordion. So we're going to go up to a point and then we'll say, we all collectively will make the decision that, all right, from this point on, we're just going to have committed people. I think that's fair. So if you want to bring some people, it's okay. So I guess we got about four more weeks or something like that, and then we will uh, close it up. That's fair? All right, so you can invite people, but tell them that at some point they're going to have to be committed to this. All right? What I want to do tonight is just do a quick review of what we did last week and then go right into forward to the second edition. Last week I told you we start with an open mind, and the front page right here says that has no words. So when you're doing a book study, you probably will learn things that you don't hear in the uh, average meeting. You know, like we learned about uh, anonymous last week and why they did it. You know, so I'm gonna go over a few things and then we're gonna go right into the second edition. Uh, last week we studied that Alcoholics Anonymous, the story of how many of thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. We looked at the word recovered. And that means to return to a condition, okay? And so they had recovered. And then we went down a little farther and we found out what they recovered from. And it said that, that they recovered from a, hope, a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. It says we, this is in forward to the first edition. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men. You don't have to follow me right here. I'm just going to do a quick review. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. You know, we have a disease, and we're going to go into the disease. You're going to hear about the disease all the way up to page 30. So, by the, step one is on page 30. So, we're going to cover all this information, and by the time you get to step one, you will have 100% knowledge of how to do step one. Uh, when I first came into the program, I did the 12 steps off the board, and we have them hanging up there, and I, I did like, okay, it said, we are, step one, we admitted we are powerless over alcohol, comma, or slash, that our lives have become unmanageable. I looked up there, and I said, yep, my life is unmanageable. I don't finish my step one. I had no idea what the disease concept was. I had no understanding of anything. But in my mind, I had done step one. So it was time to go to step two. And that was another yep two. Oh, yep, it's all the way down until it got time to make amends. When I had to make amends, I said, well, all I had to do is my mother and my ex-wife. If I do them, I don't finish my steps. And I was in relapse mode the whole time. I have no knowledge of it. The 12 steps is like a good recipe, or the book is like a good recipe for a piece of cake. If I went to Erica's house, and let's say Erica made a German chocolate cake, and I enjoyed her cake, 
And I, in my mind, I said, well, I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to pick up the ingredients and I'm going to make me a German chocolate cake. But I never asked her for the recipe. All I wanted was the cake. So I just went on my own understanding. I leaned on my own understanding. I went to the grocery store. I picked up the ingredients that I thought was in the cake. I know maybe it was some coconut. I know it had chocolate. Tell you like some pecans. You had to have some flour, you know, and some eggs and some sugar. So I bought what I thought was the ingredients. I get home and I mix this stuff up. I'm going to make me a German chocolate cake. Well, when I put it in the oven and bring it out, you think my cake going to resemble hers? No. Because I lean on my own understanding. I did not have the recipe for the cake. That's what happens in the 12 steps. People do the steps without the recipe. They lean on their own understanding, then they relapse, and they come back in the room saying, well, you know what? 12 steps don't work. No, it don't. You didn't do no 12 steps. You lean on your own understanding and did your own step. You just read the steps off the board. It's similar to reading a uh, uh, good newspaper article. You know, uh, such and such. You know, if you read the headlines, the headlines will say something. And if you stop at the headlines and don't read the context under the headlines, you're just leaning on your own understanding. So when you just start discussing about what you read in the headline, a lot of times you could be wrong because you didn't go any further. So it's the same with the 12 step. So it says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. They wrote this book so they can show us the recipe to recovery. That makes sense? If you're recovering without the recipe, you are leaning on your own understanding. I'm here to tell you. Um, so that brings us basically up to forward to the second edition. But I just want to go over one more thing. One thing that I thought was important. You got to remember that the first 164 pages of the big book, which is the program of recovery, has not changed. Over the uh, course of the editions that they came out, the first, second, third, and the fourth, they did not change the program of recovery. So AA is made of two parts. NA is two parts. CA is two parts. SA, EA, you have the fellowship and the program. The program is in the book. I know I go to a lot of meetings and people I know have not studied the book, have not done the 12 steps, and they will be telling uh, or sharing about how well they work in their program. In the back of my mind, I be saying, all you working is the fellowship. You are a professional fellowshipper. You got the lingo, you can share, you can rock the house. A year from now, I see you walking the street. You don't relapse. You are a professional fellowshipper. You can't do you. You can't replace this, the twelve step with service work either. GSR and all this, and secretary and treasurer is not the twelve steps. That's just service work. That makes sense. All right. Um. Let's start tonight. Forward to the second edition. We have one reader this week. And we're going to go paragraph by paragraph. We're going to look up words that we need to look up. Because it's important to have a dictionary. And it's surely important to always have your AA book. Alright, uh, Aaron, you going to read tonight? Yeah. <clears throat> since the original board, excuse me, since the original forward to this book was written in 1939, a wholesale miracle has taken place. Our earliest printing voice the hope that every alcoholic who journeys will find the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous at his dis destination. Already continues the early text, twos and threes and fives of us sprung up in our community. All right, let's stop there. It says, since the original forward to this book, they're talking about the first edition, was written in 1939, a wholesale miracle has taken place. What is a miracle? The act of God, divine intervention. So a miracle has taken place, and they say a wholesale miracle, so I'm guessing, and I'm, I'm assuming they're talking about your books. Right. Okay. 
we know recovery is a miracle, and we're going to talk about that later, but we're talking on a wholesale miracle. And our earliest printing voiced the hope that every alcoholic who journeys will find the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous at his destination. To me, that's like a prophecy. That's a vision. You know, that was a huge imagination for these drunks. These drunks, you know, 100 men and women who were alcoholics, who spent most of their, their adult life in a cloud, in a fog, oblivion, had the imagination to envision every alcoholic. Every alcoholic who journeys to find the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Their vision was to have Alcoholics Anonymous globally over the entire world. That baffles me. Sometimes we get together, we can't see no farther than the front door. But their vision was a global vision. They wanted every alcoholic to be able to get clean and sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. I think that's fantastic. Alright. It says, then it goes on to say, already continues the early text twos and threes and five of us has sprung up in other communities. <laughs> they have a look, two, two, three, and five groups. Five little groups have a vision for Alcoholics Anonymous to be over the whole globe. The entire world. To me, that's the miracle. Alright. Second one. Sixteen years have elapsed between our first printing of this book and the presentation in 1955 of our second edition. In that brief space, Alcoholics Anonymous has mushroomed into nearly 6,000 groups whose membership is far above 150,000 recovered alcoholic groups are to be found in each of the United States and all of the provinces of Canada. AA has flourishing communities in the British Isles, the Scandinavian countries, South Africa, South America, Mexico, Alaska, Australia, and Hawaii, all told promising beginnings have been made in some 50 foreign countries and U.S. possessions. Some are just now taking shape in Asia. Many of our friends encourage us by saying that this is but a beginning, only the, the angry, Aubrey. I mean, augury of our of a much larger future ahead. All right, what they're saying right here in this paragraph is that 16 years has elapsed between the first printing of this book and the presentation in 1955 of our second edition. In that brief spa uh, space, Alcoholics Anonymous has mushroomed into nearly 6,000 groups whose membership is far above 150,000 recovered, excuse me, alcoholics, what they're saying is that in 16 years, almost AA is all over the world. And it's still but a small beginning. The group, 6,000 group, has spread in what they say in the in that brief period of time with over uh, 150,000 members that have recovered. They're talking about people who are clean and sober. They recovered from that hopeless state of mind and body. So AA has starting to spread between the first and the second book. All right? So the miracle has definitely taken place. And when they're talking about a mushroom, they're talking about just a little stem. You know how it starts small, and all of a sudden it just explodes at the top. So that's what, and that's what most things do if it's done right. You can really see something because expansion is God. Most things start small and expand. That's how you know if you're on the right track, you'll see that expansion. Uh, what? What? Walmart. Uh, McDonald's. We see it in, in our lifestyle. You know, my lifetime. Uh, especially uh, one that I'm really, really familiar with 
is uh, Chick Fil A. The first Chick Fil A was, it was right over here in Greenbrier. The first Chick Fil A ever was in Greenbrier, right down the street. Now they're everywhere. So they start out small and then the mushroom effect, and that's what AA did. All right, let's go to the next one. The spark that was to flare into the first AA group was struck at Akron, Ohio in June 1935 during a talk between a New York stockbroker and an Akron physician. Six months earlier, the broker had been relieved of his drunk obsession by a sudden spiritual experience. Following a meeting with an alcoholic friend who he had been in contact with the Oxford group of that day. He had also been greatly helped by the late Dr. William Dean Silkworth, a New York specialist in alcoholism, who is now accounted no less than a medical saint by AA members and whose story of the early days of our society appears in the next pages. From this doctor, the broker had learned the grave nature of alcoholism. Through, though he could not accept all the tenets of the Oxford groups, he has convinced of the need for moral inventory, confession of personality defects, restitution <laughs> to those harmed, helpfulness to others, and the necessity of belief in the dependence upon God. All right, let's stop there. We're going to do a little history. That's what they're going to take us to a little history of AA. All right. The spark that was to flare into the first AA group was struck in Akron, Ohio, in June 1935 during a talk between a New York stock broker. That's Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson, and an Akron physician, that's Dr. Bob. Six months earlier, the broker had been relieved of his drink obsession by a sudden spiritual experience. All right, let me just break that down real fast. To make this story short, because it's going to show up again in Bill's story, what happened was Bill Wilson, right, I'm just paraphrasing it right now. Remember that word paraphrasing Bill Wilson had been in treatment three times in Towns Hospital in New York City he had met with Dr. Silkworth he, inside he had a spiritual experience a bright light had came in he was relieved of his drink obsession All right. so God entered his life we're going to study this later the difference between spiritual experiences and spiritual awakenings we're going to study that so what happened was Bill goes to Akron, Ohio, on a business deal, which was supposed to be favorable to him. So Bill was already a stockbroker, you know, in his, in his day, so he knew how to make a lot of money in the stocks. So what he did was he went to Akron, Ohio, and the deal fell apart. It didn't work. When he was there, he was in a hotel. He was almost broke. You know, to his standards, he was broke. He was pacing up and down in the lobby, walking back and forth. At one end was a bar, with, and he can hear people in the bar drinking and laughing and having a good time. And on the other end was a phone booth with a directory in it. So he kept going back and forth. So what happened was, he goes in, he says, all right, I need to work with another alcoholic. I need to work with another alcoholic instead of going in this bar. He goes in there, he dials the phone directly, he finds a finds out about excuse me, Dr. Bob. He go and meet Dr. Bob. Now, the, this is the miracle when they say the spark, this is the miracle that started AA. How many people in here, I don't know, is from the north? How many people, New York or you know, up north? Alright, we got a few people from the north. How many people from the south? Alright, now this is the south. Now, I got to tell you guys, y'all New Yorkers and Boston's and all this kind of stuff. Southern people think that y'all fast-talking city slipsticks. 
Just there's, there's always yipping and yapping and moving too fast and talking about this and talking about that. And y'all probably think everybody down here country dumb. Correct? So you get those two together, it's not a good mix. Am I right or wrong? On a normal situation. So now you got Bill Wilson who learned the disease of addiction. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this again and again and again. He knew the disease of addiction. He goes to Dr. Bob's house. This man is a physician, a country doctor. This New York stockbroker goes to the country doctor's house and explains to him his medical condition when it comes to alcoholism. The doctor listened, took it in, and never drank again. That had to be a miracle. Because on the normal circumstances, no doctor going to listen to no fast-talking city <laughs> slickster <laughs> from New York, and he's in Akron, Ohio. Am I right or wrong? Right. For him to, to quiet up and, and put his ears into this thing and believe the man, and sober up never to drink again, that's the, that's the spark that started AA. Everything starts with a miracle. Nothing happened by accident. That makes sense? So, with that in mind, now we can really get a better understanding. The spark there with the flare. And everything got to start with a spark. Remember that, Wayne? Flare until uh, the first AA group was struck in Akron, Ohio in June 1935. Between, uh, during a talk between a New York stockbroker, Dr. Uh, I mean, Bill Wilson, and an acting physician, that's Dr. Bob. Six months earlier, the broker had been relieved, that means freed, from his drink obsession by sudden spiritual experiences. We're going to study this a little later on, maybe, maybe next week or the week after. Following a meeting with a alcoholic friend who had been in contact with the Oxford groups of that day. That guy's name was Ebby. What I did was, I passed you, and uh, the Oxford group had six steps, not twelve. I gave you all a list. You got one? Let me see it right fast. And it shows the Oxford group did have six step, steps. So AA, Bill Wilson them did not literally come up with the whole 12-step system. They got six of them from the Oxford groups. Bill was a, a member of the Oxford group too. So it says right here, number one, we admitted that we were licked, that we were powerless over alcohol. Step two, made a moral inventory of our defects or sins. Step three, we confessed or shared our shortcoming with another person in confidence. Step four, made restitution to all those we had harmed by our drinking. Step five, we tried to help other alcoholics with no thought of reward and money or prestige. Step six, we prayed to whatever God we thought there was for power to practice these precepts. So we, they had six steps, and what Bill now came up with twelve steps. They just wanted to make the steps easier for people to understand and follow. That makes sense. So they got them from the offering groups. All right. It goes on to say that uh, this is important right here that he had that Bill Wilson had also been greatly helped by the late. Dr. William D. Silkworth, a New York specialist in alcoholism, who is now accounted no less than a medical saint by AA's member, and whose story of the earlier days of our society appears in the next pages. Listen to this. From this doctor, the broker had learned the grave nature of alcoholism. Dr. Silkworth taught the world the disease concept of alcoholism. It's important, you know, for us to be disciples of this disease concept. There's too many people in recovery have never even heard of it. Or heard of it in a in a, a terminology used in the fellowship, but don't understand. Nobody breaks down the disease concept. Alright? And that's the first thing that went out. But in the days meetings I go to is the last thing you hear. 
But these people were disease concept people. That makes sense? That's what they did. Alright? And the aqua group did not even have the disease concept. Those people didn't have it. Alright? So it goes on to say that though he could not accept all the tenets of the Oxford groups, he was convinced of the need of more inventory, confession of personality defense, restitution of those harm, helpfulness to other than the necessity of belief in and dependence upon God. Let's keep going. Prior to his journey to Akron, the broker had worked hard with many alcoholics on the theory that only an alcoholic could help another alcoholic. But he had succeeded only in keeping sober himself. The broker had gone to Akron on a business venture which had collapsed, leaving him greatly in fear that he might start drinking again. He suddenly realized that in order to save himself, he must carry his message to another alcoholic. That alcoholic turned out to be the Akron physician. Uh, we kind of went over the history a little bit, right? but there's some it's something very important in here and this goes for every alcoholic that I know of including myself time has nothing to do with this one I don't care if you got 20 years clean or two days clean it says that prior to his journey to Akron the broker had worked hard with many alcoholics on the theory that only an alcoholic could help an alcoholic but he has succeeded only in keeping himself sober what he was doing was he was going around and we're going to get to his story though. He was going around and he was telling people about his spiritual experience. He was preaching. He was talking about everything but the disease concept. Dr. Seltworth said, Bill, the reason you can't keep nobody clean and sober, the reason you cannot uh, uh, help anybody because you're putting the cart in front of the horse. You got to tell them what's wrong with them first instead of trying to tell them about the spiritual experiences and how God done saved your life, that they're not listening to that. The first person that Bill told the disease concept to was Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob sobered up, never to use again. So my point is, why are we running around here as disciples of the 12-step program, of people who try to sponsor everybody, and we're not talking about the disease concept? We're putting a cock in front of the heart. And then calling up me later on talking about, well, my sponsor relapsed. Supposed to. Don't know, no, don't have no reason not to relapse. They don't know. <laughs> this stupid though, you know. They don't have no reason to even think about not relapsing because they know they never taught what a relapse was. I think a real relapse is somebody that get the disease concept and understand it. Practice some principle. And then relapse. If you don't know what the disease comes out, I don't even know if you relapse. I don't know what you might call that. Pre-relapse? You know, I don't know what that called. Because you really ain't been taught nothing, am I right? To stay clean and sober. <coughs> so it said the broker had gone to uh, Akron on a business venture. We stuck to that. Then he said, listen, this is, this, no, let me read it. The broker had gone to Akron on a business venture, which had collapsed leaving him greatly in fear that he might start drinking again. If you're in fear, you got any problem going on in your life, you're worried, your finances, or you got something that's overwhelming you, taking you mentally out of space, uh, uh, throwing you off, then here's what you do. He suddenly realized that in order to save himself, he must carry his message to another alcoholic. That alcoholic turned out to be Dr. Bob. If you got anything going on in your life, the best thing to do is help another alcoholic. People say, I don't know how to help an alcoholic. Yes, you do. Do the math. We helped each other get high. No alcoholic got high by themselves. We helped each other get high. So we can turn around and help each other stay clean and sober. Even if you just take them to a meeting. Talk to somebody. Your story help anybody. All right, let's keep going. This physician had repeatedly tried spiritual means to resolve his alcoholic dilemma, but had failed. Read that again. 
for yourself. Okay. This physician had repeatedly tried spiritual means to resolve his alcoholic dilemma, but had failed. But when the broker gave him Dr. Silkworth's description of alcoholism and it, its hopelessness, the physician began to pursue the spiritual remedy for his malady with a willing with a willingness he had never before been able to muster he sobered never to drink again up to the moment of his death in 1950 this seemed to prove that one alcoholic could affect another as no alcoholic could it also indicated that strenuous work one alcoholic with another was vital to permit recovery. Uh, it is. The physician had repeatedly tried spiritual means to resolve his alcohol dilemma, but had failed. What are some spiritual means? Church. Going to church. What else? Retreats. Uh, getting saved. Uh, meditating. Uh, tithing. You know, the list go on and on and on. Going sitting on top of a mountain, just humming to the sky. You know, whatever. But it all failed. It all failed. That should be a wake up call. It all what? Failed. Failed. But when the broker gave him Dr. Silk with description of the disease concept and his hopelessness, the physician began to pursue the spiritual remedy for his disease with a willingness he had never before been able to muster. The muster means to bring together. Bring everything to perspective. He sobered never to drink again to the moment of his death. This seemed to prove that one alcoholic could affect another as no non-alcoholic could. Here's the deal though. It also indicated that hard work, one alcoholic with another was vital. That's a key word right there. To permanent recovery. If you want to stay permanently recover, recovered or in recovery or sober, you need to work with other people. It's vital means necessary for life. Life, life giving, vital, like your vital organs in your body, like your heart is a vital organ, your brain is a vital organ, it's necessary for life. You got to have a heart and a brain to live. So the thing is, if you want to stay clean and sober, you got to help others. It's vital. It's necessary for your life to work with other alcoholics and addicts. That makes sense. All right, let's keep going. Hence, the two men set to work almost frantically upon alcoholics arriving in the ward of the Akron City Hospital. Their very first case, a desperate one recovered immediately and became AA number three. He never had another drink. This work at Akron continued through the summer of 1935. There, many failures, but there was occasionally heartening success. When the broker returned to New York in the fall of 1935, the first AA group had actually been formed, though no one realized it at the time. Here's the two men set to work frantically, almost frantically upon alcoholics arriving in the ward in, in uh, Akron City Hospital. The very first case, I got, this guy, I think his name was Bill too, a desperate one Recovered immediately and became AA number three. He had never drank again. All right. Then they went through some failures and there, and then they would get a, get somebody to stay clean and sober. Then some failures, then clean and sober. But by uh, the fall of 1935, they had formed that first AA group in Akron, Ohio. All right. Let's keep going. A second small group promptly took shape at New York to the to be followed in 1937 with the start of a third at Cleveland. Besides these, there were scattered all alcoholics who had picked up the basics, basic idea in Akron or New York who were trying to form groups in other cities. By late 1937, the number of members having substantial sobriety time behind them was sufficient to convince the membership that a new light had entered the dark world of the alcoholic. 
I like this paragraph. This is for me. This is one of my favorites. A second group promptly took shape in New York to be followed in 1937 with the start of a third group. This is the third AA group in Cleveland. Besides these, there were scattered alcoholics who had picked up the basic ideals in Akron or New York who were trying to form groups in other cities. They didn't even have a big book out. But they was catching these 12 steps, you know, alcoholic, you know. And then they were starting to have, uh, get clean and sober. And then they was going out and starting group. And they hadn't even put their 12 steps in print. Now, if that's not willingness, what is willingness? We got people now, and I, you know, I'm just, by the grace of God, I ain't one. That got the, got everything. Got it in print. Got it on the computer. Got it in song, got it in script, got it in uh, uh, diction, got it everywhere. Wearing it. And wearing it and don't read it. It's everywhere. You walk around with the book. Sharing. <laughs> wow, that's weird. that's weird. It said by late 1937, the number of members having some Natural sobriety time behind them was sufficient to convince the membership that a new light had entered the dark world of, of the alcoholic. It was like, if there's going to be hell for alcoholic, there was no proving success until this started. Now they was able to say, you know what, y'all, we have something that really, truly works. Probably don't know what to do with it. But we have something that works. This really works. Look at us. We're clean and sober. What we're going to do. All right, let's go. It was now time the struggling groups thought to place their message and unique experience before the world. This determination bore fruit in the spring of 1939 by the publication of this volume. The membership had then reached about 100 men and women, the fledgling society, which had been nameless, now began to call, to be called Alcoholics Anonymous. From the title of its own book, The Flying Blind Period Ended, and AA entered a new phase of its pioneering time. Uh, it was now time the struggling group thought to, you see that word, struggling. Group thought to place their message and unique experience before the world. That's it going back to the vision. They always stayed in line with the vision to carry this message of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous be to every alcoholic who journeys on earth. So now they say, okay, we have experience now. Before it was just an idea. It was just in their imagination. Now they don't took their imagination and manifest it in experience. Now it's a working tool. It's not in the idea of the minds no more. It's actively active in the world. So they're going to take this unique experience before the world. This determination bore fruit fruit. In the spring of 1939, by the publication of this volume, the AA book, the membership had reached about 100 men and women. The fledgling society, fledgling means, you know how you have a little bird in a nest, your little eggs, and then the birds come out, and the mom and daddy feed the birds. You know, the wings start to they grow, and they be standing on the edge, and they don't know whether they're going to fly or not. That's fledgling, standing right there, and then they push them off. Kind of like what happened to us. You want to stay in, step up, and flick it in. Get your ass, bop, <laughs> push you out. <laughs> now you got to fly. But that's how it was. They, they need to grow, that's all. They need to grow. So it said, which had been named, it now became called, the group became called Alcoholics Anonymous from the title of the book. The blind period ended and AA ended a new phase of its pioneering time. Every time you go through one phase, it's to be it's the end of one probably and the beginning of what? Another one. Let's keep going. With the appearance of the new book, a great deal began to happen. 
Dr. Harry Emerson Fodstick, the noted clergyman, reviewed it with approval. In the fall of 1939, Fulton Arsler, then editor of Liberty, printed a piece of his magazine called Alcoholics and God. This brought a rush of 800 frantic inquiries into the little New York office, which meanwhile had been established. Each inquiry was painstaking, painstakingly answered. Pamphlets and books were sent out. Businessmen traveling out of existing groups were referred to these prospective newcomers. New groups started up and it was found to the astonishment of everyone that AA's message could be transmitted in the mail as well by word of mouth. By the end of 1939, it was estimated that 800 alcoholics were on their way to recovery. All right, here's the deal with this one. It says, with the appearance of the new book, a great deal began to happen. Once they got the book out, things started happening. All right. Uh, Dr. Harry Emerson Fostick, the noted clergyman, he was a preacher, you know, you know the one, I guess it was, you know, like, Joel Austin, reviewed it with approval. You get one of those guys to, uh, uh, say that this thing works, mm -hmm. now you got the church. Which is a good thing, though. That's a very good thing, because you don't want them to say it don't work. You want the church on your side, especially the the pastors and the ministers and the spiritual and religious leaders who got enough common sense to say, let AA do its thing in here. Let me stand back and let the people recover. Let me don't interfere. You know, he says in the fall of 1939, Fulton also the editor of the Liberty, you know, the magazine wrote an article called Alcoholics and God. Once the, the, the media and people start getting involved, the friends of AA, once they start getting involved, it started to span out. It started to grow. All right. It says that this brought a rush of 800 frantic inquiries into the little uh, New York office, which meanwhile had been established. Remember, we were talking about them being bum rushed for uh, anonymous, being anonymous. That's exactly what happened, didn't it? Once they found out that people can stay clean and sober, boom. Nobody else was able to say that on earth. But AA could. So it says that each inquiry, listen to this. This is important. Each inquiry was painstakingly answered. Pamphlets and books were sent out. They were mailing it out. Bam, bam, bam. Put it in the mail. Bam, bam. People were buying it. They were sending it out. People were in their family. Their uncle got it. The father's alcohol. The uncle's alcohol. Sister and brother. They were sending them the books. All right. Businessmen traveling out of the existing group were referred to these prospective newcomers. New groups started up, and it was found to the astonishment of everyone that AA's message could be transmitted in the mail as well as by word of mouth. By the end of 1939, it was an estimated that 800 alcoholics were on their way to recovery. When the book started going out, they were able to stay clean and sober from the book. These people didn't have no groups. Somebody will order it. If I'm an alcoholic, my brother ordered the book for me. The book come in, I read the book. I study the book. I work the steps. The steps is in the book. They tell me exactly what to do in the book. And they were staying clean and they were forming group. Businessman come in. They got my address from the manifest. I guess the shipping thing, you know what I'm trying to say. If you go into Atlanta, you got drunk ass Robert down there in Atlanta. He reading the book. Go down there and get us some help. They will come in. Contact me, sponsor me, do you know the much time as they could. I stayed clean stove. I start uh start a book study here. And it was broke. My point is people were staying clean and sober from the book. They didn't have fellowships to run to and do good sharing. They didn't have that, Willie. They had only the book. So it's different today, ain't it? <laughs> Let's keep going. I told you gonna be coming here with over mind. Don't come in here with, with a lot of that crap you don't learn somewhere else. I'm going straight out the book. They ain't have no fellowship, Erica. 
Let's go. In the spring of 1940, John D. Rockefeller Jr. gave a dinner for many of his friends to which he invited AA members to tell their stories. News of it of this got on the world wires. Inquiries poured in again, and many people went to the bookstores to get the book Alcoholics Anonymous. By March 1941, the membership had shot up to 2,000. Then Jack Alexander wrote a featured article in the Saturday Evening Post and placed such a compelling picture of AA before the general public that alcoholics in need of help really dog really dodged us. By the close of the 1941 AA number 8,000 members. The mushrooming process was in full swing. AA had become a national institution. All right, uh, Rockefeller Jr. gave a dinner and he invited many friends. And when they got there, uh, uh, you know, drunks got up and told their stories. They were really astonished. Amazed that you can have this guy that was skid row, now he's clean and sober. And got some substantial time behind him, working a job, be a uh, productive member of society. You know, and, and, and that was the first time they heard stories like this. You know what I'm trying to say? Because everybody was up under impression because of the dark age that if you want an alcoholic, you're going to die an alcoholic. Always an alcoholic. All right, so that happened. And then the uh, Saturday evening post, you know, well, that's a big one. Once they got the news, people start ordering the books. And start growing. So the membership by 1941, I think that's what it said, had numbered like 8,000 members. And now it's a national institution. So what we're doing is AA is spreading from the book. And still the foundation is the book, y'all. I'm, I'm going to keep saying this over and over and over. The foundation of our recovery is the book. Without the book study, without knowing the book, I don't know what you got. Because you not don't have the program. You got to download the program in your life. You got to download the program in your mind. If you go to a, 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 a go and buy a nice computer and it don't have all the type of printer that you might have or you've got and got this special printer and it don't have the, the software in there so if you go and get the printer and you bring it back and you don't have the software but you go and connect it in the back and everything and you hit print what's gonna happen not gonna print anything because you did not download the software if you run around here talking about you clean and sober and you hit print <laughs> and you haven't downloaded the software, disaster. That makes sense? You got to download the program. All right, let's keep going. I'm going to see if we can get out of here about 12 minutes. Our Which society then entered a fearsome and exciting adolescent period. The test that it faced was this. Could these large numbers of erstwhile erratic alcoholics successfully meet and work together? Would there quarrel? Would there be quarrels over membership, leadership, and money? Would there be striving for power and prestige? Would there be schiz schism, mm -hmm. which would split split AA apart? Soon AA was beset by the by these very problems on every side and in every group but out of this frightening and it at first disrupting experience the conviction grew that AA had to hang together or die separately we had to unify our fellowship or pass off the scene all right, so now they're get, they getting and getting in to have a fellowship. You got a lot of people clean and sober, so now they got a lot of groups. So they're having all this chaos going on in the groups. People want to do this for money. They want to have power, and you know what I'm trying to say. They want to split it apart, and they want to do all this mess. So it says right here, but and and it, it, I guess that's like in any company, like our company, or whatever. It says that, but out of this frightening and at first disrupting experience the conviction grew deep down in their heart grew the idea that AA had to hang together or die separately we had to unify our fellowship or pass off the scene 
the fellowship was destroying it. The attitude of the fellowship. It was overpowering the 12 steps and people were going berserk. So, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that in the midst of all that confusion, they had to, were born the ideal that we got to change. We can't continue like this or we won't have AA. That makes sense? And that's the same as in any job. That's the same as up here. That's the same as any work in any family. You got all this chaos. You can keep the drama going. Or you need to stop and make some corrections and let's get back on track. And that's what they did. And it saved the fellowship. All right, let's keep going. As we discovered the principles by which the individual alcoholic could live, so we had to evolve principles by which the AA groups and AA as a whole could survive and function effectively. It was thought that no alcoholic man or woman could be excluded from our society, that our leaders might, be, might serve but never govern, that each group was to be autonomous and there was to be no professional class of therapy. There was to be no fees or dues or expenses were to be met by our own voluntary contributions. There was to be the least possible organization, even our service centers, our public relations were to be based upon attraction rather than promotion. It was decided that all members are to be anonymous as the level of press, radio, TV, and films, and in no circumstances should we give endorsements, make alliances, or enter public controversy. So what happened is, and this is they came up with the 12 traditions all right, for the fellowship, and we got them up on the board over there. But what I do like about this, it says that as we discovered the principles by which the individual alcoholic could live, those are the 12 steps. So we had to evolve principles by which AA groups and AA as a whole could survive, survive and function effectively. That's the 12 traditions. So now we got the 12 steps for the individual, for each one of us, and then the 12 traditions for us as a group. Alright, that's very important. But I like down here at the end, go down to the end. It says, it was decided that all members ought to be anonymous at the level of press, radio, TV, and films. And in no circumstances should we give endorsements, make alliances, or any public controversies. To this day, I have 20 years clean. And I have never seen AA endorse any political, you know, presidency, like, you know, the presidents or government. I've never seen us do that. Now, I can say we got that part right. So, all these years later, the 12 traditions still work. A lot of times, you know, when I be troubled, and I be looking at the recovery homes, or you got somebody. One of my favorite is the third one. I only, I mean, the second one. I like the second one. I always use that. Uh, our group, uh, our, it said for our group purpose, yeah, but one uh, ultimate authority. They loving God. So sometimes I look out, you know, in our group, before our group conscious, the leaders are but trusted service. They do not govern. Sometimes I look out there and I say to myself, I ain't trying to govern anything, but our common welfare should come first. Personal uh, recovery depends upon AA unity. And I look out there and I see somebody that's just messing up everything. You know, destroying people's, uh, doing all kind of silly stuff that's uh, jeopardizing someone else's recovery. They got to go. Because our common welfare should come first. Not that one person acting like a park eight. Swinging from limb to limb to limb. You can swing right on out the door. You know, that's what it's all about. The common welfare. You got somebody that ain't trying to do it, he got to go. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what the 12 editions is for. Alright, let's keep going. This was the substance of AA's 12 traditions, which was which are stated in full on page 561 of this book. Though none of these principles 
had the force of rules or laws, they had become so widely accepted by 1950 that they were com confirmed by the first international conference held at Cleveland. Today, the remarkable unity of AA is one of the greatest assets that our society has. Well, that's what I was saying earlier. Uh, it was accepted, these 12 traditions was accepted into uh, AA at the first international conference held at Cleveland. That was in 1950. And it goes down to say that today, the remarkable unity of AA is one of the greatest assets that our society has. Even though we don't have no dues, we don't have no fee, you got to pay all them quality dues and membership and this and that, AA still holds together. It's still on this earth because of the 12 traditions, y'all. And that's very important. You might have a lot of relapsing and stuff, but the group still hang together. But we got a lot of sobriety, too. All right, let's keep going. While the internal difficulties of our adolescent period were being, being ironed out, public acceptance of AA grew by leaps and bounds. For this, there were two principal reasons. The large numbers of recoveries and reunited homes, these made their impressions everywhere of alcoholics who came to AA and really tried. 50% got sober at once and remained that way. 25% sobered up after some relapses and among the remainder, those who stayed on with AA show the improvement. Other thousands came in came to a few AA meetings and at at first decided they didn't want the program. But numbers of these, about two out of three, began to return as time passed. This is important. This is really very, very important to me. While the internal difficulties of our adolescent period were being ironed out, Public acceptance of AA grew by leaps and bounds. The public was watching AA. You got your critics. You got your people saying, like, you know, they say they can keep these people clean, but we're going to watch. But it says acceptance grew by leaps and bounds. And there were two pr um, principal reasons. There were two reasons that people was accepting AA. The first was the large number of recoveries. We were recovering. Our family members were watching. Our bosses were watching. The neighbors was watching. Everybody was watching us come into AA and stay clean and sober. Gradually, they started saying, you know, AA works. I remember my mother. I will never forget this. I was in St. Jude's. Just coming into treatment, I guess I had about six months clean. For six months, my mother, she's a religious lady, and I had been a member of the church, right? You know, she was telling me, Lee St. Jude's, I don't like the way it smells. I came over there and they had some, she told me one time they had some lemonade. And the lemonade didn't taste right, you need to leave. So, for six months, she was trying to get me out of there to come back to the church. Uh, the pastor, you know, I guess you want to look good, you know, for the church. And the, the pastor and then was asking about me, and she was telling him I was doing good, but she kept whispering in my ear to come. So I never forget one 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 day, they had locked down the entire St. Jude's on a weekend. And someone was smoking in the bathroom, so they wouldn't let nobody out. Everybody was locked down for the weekend. But at that time, I had like uh had some plans to do, you know, make some money with my brother. I needed money. So I was going to leave to make the money. I said, well, I don't need St. Jude no more. I'm going to go home like my mother said. Because she wanted me to come home. So Friday, we were on lockdown till Sunday, no, Monday morning. So right before the lockdown, I ran down to the IHOP and I called my mother. I said, look, Mom, uh, I'm supposed to work with my brother. And St. Jude said, well, I can't leave this weekend, but I really need the money. I said, I'm coming home. Now, prior, we got to remember that for six months, she told me to come home. When I told her I was coming home, 
I got dead silence on the other end of the phone. <laughs> Nothing came out of that woman's mouth. I said, Mom, Mom, you there? You there? I heard nothing. I guess she thought about it. Public acceptance. About 30 seconds, maybe a minute, went through, you know, by, and I heard her say, Oh, no! You need to stay right where you are. She thought about that, that drunk and that getting high in her house. She said, Oh, no, St. Jude's is a wonderful place. You belong there. You need to stay. She had finally accepted AA. And the uh, treatment center. Because two reasons. Number one, I was staying clean and sober. And I was reunited back to the family. I just had to come to her house to be reunited. You know? And that's what happened. It said for two reasons. They, 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 they embraced us because of the number of recoveries and reunited home. And they mean my family. You know, you're back with your mother. You're back talking to your, your people. You know, they seeing you and, and they enjoying and they don't have to pray and worry about you no more. They got more confidence that you're going to be okay. That's very important. All right. Then it goes on to say that these made the impressions everywhere. Everybody was seeing it. Of Alcoholics Anonymous, here's the map. Of Alcoholics Anonymous who came to AA and really tried, 50% got sober at once and remained that way. If you came into AA, all the people that came into AA and really did the 12 steps and really tried, they stayed clean. 50%. And he said, the, and the 25% uh, sobered up after some relapses. Among the remainder, and those who stayed with AA showed improvement. So you got 50% stay clean, and you got another 25% that, do some, uh, that come back after relapse. That makes 75%. All right, they're staying clean. Then it goes down to the last 25%, and it said that 25% sobered up after some relapses, relapses, and among the remainder of those who stayed on with AA showed improvement. Even if they hang around AA, they show improvement. All right. Other thousands came to a few meetings and at first decided they didn't want the program. I'm not going to understand that. I did that. I, I remember. 30 years ago, going to a AA, uh, NA meeting, an AA meeting, I'll never forget it, and I went in there, and I heard them people sharing, and it was a birthday party, and the guy had was celebrating three years, I'll never forget it, and he said that he had not had a beer in three years, or a, a, a joint, in three years, and I was sitting in the back of the room, I was about lit, you know, and uh, I looked up there, and I said, this is crap. Is nobody who drank like he said he drank haven't touched a beer in three years. I couldn't believe it. So I left. I thought they were lying. I, I couldn't, it didn't register in my mind that you could drink, you couldn't drink a beer like that. You know, three years without a beer, that's insane to me. So I got up and left. I said, he's lying. He's just fooling everybody else in here. He's telling a lie, and I know he lied. And he goes, I take him right now, he's going to drink that beer with me. <laughs> you know? I went back to the fire barrel. Ten years later, I, I believe him now. <laughs> you know? And then he goes on to say, but a great number of these, about two or three, began to sober up after some time pass. If to get through whooping you, you'll come in here. All right, let's go ahead and finish up. Another reason for the wide, another reason for the wide acceptance of AA was the ministration of friends, friends in medicine, religion, and the press together with in, in their, in their innumerable mm -hmm. others who became our able and persistent advocators. Without such support, AA could have made only the slowest progress. Some of, of, of the recommendations of AA's early medical and religious friends will be found further on in this book. But what happened is you got people from religion, medicine, uh, the press, you know, people came and supported AA. And that helped a lot. You know, you get the right people saying the right things, you get the right press at the right time, and they're supporting you. It, it went a long way. And they're going to talk about that later. Let's go. Alcoholics Anonymous 
is not a religious organization. Neither does AA take any particular medical point of view. Though we corroborate widely with the men of medicine as well as with the men of religion. All right, now, what they're saying here is that, you know, we're not a religious organization. All they're saying right now is that we cooperate with any, 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 you know, set or any denomination whatsoever. We're just not a religious organization. And we're going to explain that in a minute. Go ahead. Alcohol being no respect of persons, we are an accurate cross section of America and in distant lands. The same dramatic Democrat. democratic, e uh, the same democratic evening up pro process is now going on by personal religious affiliation with we include Catholic Protestants Jews Hindus and the sprinkling of Muslim and Buddhists more than 15% of us are women I can prove that you know AA all we trying to do right here by the democratic process is just for the people by the people we're just trying to help everybody stay clean so when we don't care what your race is we don't care what your religion is there's no respect of people. We're just here to give you these 12 steps so you can live a life, you know, that's sober. Uh, and, and hopefully a spiritual life that's sober. And if, you know, let's say I, I would practice some sort, sort of religion. And everybody come up here for the book study. And I would say, okay, we're going to get on our knees. And we probably, for the first 20 minutes, we're just going to hum to the sky. And I make everybody get on their knees. And and we put the candles out and we hum, 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 hum for 20 minutes. And then we do the book study. Then I come back here next week. I'll probably be in here with, by myself. Humming and praying and whatever, you know, whatever we're doing, I'll probably be by myself. I know 80% of y'all won't be here. See, we don't have none of that. We don't care about what nobody's religious uh, beliefs is. Because if you ain't here, <laughs> it might not work. In that respect, when it came to drinking and drugging. When it came to alcohol, whatever you, if you the high priest and you sitting in AA, then the high priestism didn't work. But the 12 steps do. That makes sense? And that's, that's hard for some people to swallow. It used to be hard for me to say that. But I can honestly say it now by watching over the years. I watch people come in treatment, tell us treatment, the 12 step don't work. I'm going back to serve my religion. Month, two months later, I see them walking up and down the street. And I'd be like, what happened? Well, I don't know. It didn't work. I said, well, the same guys that you left, they still over there cleaning us over to this day. Five years later, I see that same person. What happened? I don't know. It didn't work. You know that same group of men that you were with? They done did their 12 step. All of them living life on life terms. They all got houses. They give them, some of them got married. They all got nice jobs. They still clean and sober. So you do that year after year after year. I kind of get the impression that this thing really do work. And other stuff don't. And I'll tell you the difference later on. Let me finish with the last paragraph, then we're going to get out of here. At present, our membership is pyramiding at the rate of about 20%, 20% a year. So far, upon the total problem of several million, million actual and potential alcoholics in the world, we have made only a scratch. But, you know, sometimes I look out here, I can honestly tell you when I'm leaving here and going up the street, Going home, it's way more people out there using than used to be. With all this meth, you can see it out there. You can see a lot more crackism out there. You see a lot more drug addicts. You see more women. You see younger kids. You know, I, I don't. I was going out the other day, and I was just. I, I left here, and I was driving down the street. I seen three young men. I guess they were selling drugs. Well, they were selling drugs. I came back that next morning, they was on the same corner selling drugs. I left that evening, they was on the same corner selling drugs. 
And I came back the next day. They didn't want them for about three days. They had on the same clothes. Same little white t-shirt. Same pants. Sitting on the same corner. Three days straight. And then I just stopped looking. And I was said, let me do the math. How much money are they really making? This is like a hundred and some hours. I'd rather work at McDonald's. Because <laughs> you way below minimum wage. If you stand out on that corner like this and you haven't changed clothes in three days, it don't make no sense to me. I'd rather give me a job at McDonald's and go home. But mathematically, I thought they, they must have thought they had it going on. I don't know. But it seemed like to me they way below minimum wage. All right. It says right here, upon the third, upon therapy for the alcoholic himself, we surely have no monopoly. AA ain't the only way you can stay clean and sober. Church do work if you work it. We had a conversation the other day about church. I know when I was going to church, I was using, I guess I was using a good 80, 90 hours a week. Then I come get clean and sober. I go to church for two hours a week. My using time and my trying to stay clean time were way off balance. It didn't work. See, when I came into the meetings, when I came into the uh, Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had to, I went to meetings almost equal to my using time. That makes sense? I was doing 20, 30 uh, hours of AA every week. I wasn't like you guys coming here and think you can go to two meetings for one hour and stay clean and sober. I was, I was tallying up some hours in this program. Because I thought my using time, I needed to, to kind of like balance out the time I was spending using with the time I'm, I'm trying to stay clean and sober. Two hours wasn't going to do it for me. Mathematically, it didn't make no sense. But I guess the other people would do. Yet it, it is our great hope that all those who have yet found no answer may begin to find one in the pages of this book and will presently join us on the high road to a new freedom. The answers are found in the pages in this book. Your recovery is in this book. Alright, thank y'all for a good meeting. Alright, we'll take a, a few minutes just to briefly and answer answer any questions if we can. Go ahead, Aaron. Uh, what what stuck out to me was the uh, two people on two occasions, right after they learned, right after they heard the disease concept. It, it it's it's stuck out in the book that they got sober and stayed sober. And I thought that was a little ironic the way two occasions they 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 let you know that the story was told, and these people heard the story and they grasped it and they never let go and they went forward. So, I, I mean, there's something in the in the in the disease concept, and the person turning their life over to this program, and staying with it, is is one of the keys. That's one of the things that really stuck out. To me. Yeah, that's true. They, you have to find out what the problem is. You got a problem, a solution, and a plan of action. There's three parts to the puzzle. So if you come into if you come into AA and you don't know, you know, it's kind of like a, a puzzle with with three parts. Anybody? Let me see. Give me something. Oh, oh, that's kind of Let's say we got a puzzle with three parts. You know how kids have a puzzle with three parts? Let me do this real fast. I see your hand right there. So you got three parts. This is the problem. This is the solution. And this is the plan of action. More people come into what I, I've been seeing come into AA. They don't know what the problem is, Eric. They know they here. I got me a solution. I got a God in my understanding, and then they want to go work the twelve step. But they don't know what the problem is. So what? That's what Bill was doing. He was teaching people what the solution was. He was going to give them one part of the puzzle. But they had the plan of action from the Oxford group. Remember the steps. Oxford group didn't even know what the problem was. Dr. Sit would say, "Hey, hey, do this first. Let's give them part one of the puzzle." Then we get them part two of the puzzle. Then we get part three of the problem, puzzle error. You got all three parts of the puzzle. Now you can recover. You cannot recover without three all three parts. You got to have all three parts. Where, where, where exactly is the, the concept? Doctor's opinion. We're getting there. We'll be starting it next week. We're not there.
No, no, no. But if you want it, you can get the CD. I got a CD. Okay. I got it on YouTube. Oh, I swear, I swear I've seen it. Okay. It's on YouTube. Go to YouTube. Look up Robert Greg Barber. The disease concept is there. But it's not going to be like me sitting down here explaining it to you face to face. Because it'll probably take two weeks to do it. Go ahead. Anybody else? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, two words. I'm not sure what page it was on. Uh, schism, I think. Schism. Yeah, atone. What is it? Schism. Schism mm -hmm. and atonement, I think. All of it? Mm-hmm. But what's the question? What do they mean? That means you going to find out and bring it back next week. I got it. <laughs> All right. I told you I have a dictionary. Go ahead. What Last was the question. Word? Accuracy. Augury. 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 He got assignment to come back in with his dictionary and give us what the meanings of the word in the context of what they're using it. Go ahead. Another good thing, Rob, that I saw and that, that you pointed out, and, and I'm guilty of this, you said the cart before the horse. And that's one of the biggest things that I see that everybody's caught up in. People get into the fellowship and go into the meetings and sharing good and this and that and the other, but they don't get into the book aspect of it and reading. You saw that the book solved it for uh, all, all those alcoholics earlier. Without the meetings, the book solved their problem and they never drank again. But now people are running and jumping into the meetings and don't even get a book until maybe a year later they'll get a book and start reading. If they start reading it. They get a book and put it on the shelf and, and use the fellowship. And if you, when we study, it's going to tell us the fellowship alone will not keep you clean and sober. That's in the book. The fellowship alone will not keep you clean and sober. That's in the book. So if you didn't, if you didn't read that in the book and you didn't comprehend it, then you, you're going to think that the fellowship alone will keep you clean and sober. But that's not what's in the book. All right, so we can conclude. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Who, Father? Lord, Lord, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the, the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank God. All right. We can cut it off now. I am at you don't think that light was too bright? Uh -huh. It's an hour and 17 minutes.